Hey, what's up? Welcome to Basecraft. So, it's been a while since I was talking to you. I was on tour for two weeks. I caught the crone on the tour. Lost another two weeks of my life there. And then that was the end of November. So, I just didn't get time or had no chance getting out of podcast. But I'm back now with this Christmas episode. I did pick up a bass on the tour. This Scott Whitley SWV1 from Chowney. Uh, 24 fret. Um, short scale active bass really cool if you want to hear about that just pop over to my Instagram I'm doing like catch ups with old guests from the show on Instagram live just you know instead of doing the big long podcast with their life story I'm just asking them you know what's gone on for you this year so that's cool so follow me on Instagram for that um other than that yeah that's this is the last podcast of the year just want to say thanks to everyone who's listened to the podcast all year everyone who's message me like the pages bought t-shirts all that stuff going to keep it going obviously next year hoping to maybe get two out a month one a month definitely and um yeah just keep chasing up uh, good guests like we've done all this year couldn't be happier with how the first year the podcast went had all every guest i had on my pocket list i got straight away and then i was like all right this i've done that now what next so i just kept finding guests and emailing them and they all came on which is amazing so I've been looking to get this fella on for a while, Mike O'Connell. Um, prob- definitely, I'd say, the busiest session bass player in Cork. He's playing with um, Mick Flannery, Mark O'Reilly, Jack O'Rourke, loads of other people. Uh, he played the bass for Ariel Posen when he lived in Cork. Um, really busy bassist, absolutely class. I've seen him play in the city a few times. And um, yeah, we just had a really nice chat. We were a lot of chat about touring because, you know, he's he's plays in a bunch of different bands. He's done a lot of European and American tours so yeah a bit of wine tasting in Portland uh, nine hour drives through Europe to gigs that kind of stuff and um, he, he's getting into double bass at the moment so he's only playing it like with two years but he's gigging it with, with, in proper big gigs so it's great to hear the perspective of someone who's doing that and um, no bother to him I've heard him playing it and I didn't know he'd only been playing it that short time so he's obviously picking it up really quick so um, hope you enjoyed the episode as usual like subscribe all that stuff and uh, have a great Christmas and um, yeah I'll talk to you in the new year you yeah, know yeah. more about that, that than I would sure you've got a degree a degree in music technology you would think so <laughs> <laughs> no no not really no no interest in that anymore not anymore no as soon as I finish the degree <laughs> really yeah 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 pretty much and what made you want to go do it then if, if you kind of had no interest by the end like before I started, it seemed like a good idea. You know, it's like, oh, I'd get into recording or uh, doing live sound or whatever. And uh, it seemed like a, that would be cool. But sure, you do it for a few years. And I was gigging as well the whole time. And sure at the end of it, I was like, well, gigging is, is way better than being the person setting up and taking down a PA. Like being the person yeah. on the stage, is, that's way better. Like... <laughs> So it took, took me the, to do the degree to realize that. Really? Yeah. So you, you don't remember yeah. any? You don't you don't use any of the stuff out of it. You don't do home recording or the odd live uh, sound gig or anything. Um, I mean, I do a bit of home recording. All right, so you have experience with that that I might have done in college. But sure, you know, everyone has that experience. You know, like all you have to do is do a little tutorial on YouTube or whatever. It's it's very everything's so user friendly you now and. Um, I do a bit of live sound just with, like, if I was doing a, a like bar gigs or whatever, I would usually run the PA myself, like, mm. in the band, you know. Yeah, I saw you playing in the city there a few weeks, well, it must be months ago at this stage. You were playing in, like, a cover band, but it was it was good crack. Yeah. You got to do, like, a bass, yeah. solo, a bass solo and everything, like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was at, uh, in a three-piece. So usually with the, when there's only three of us, there had to be plenty of bass solos, all right? <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. If there, if it, yeah, if there's a lead guitar player or a piano player there, I usually just leave it to them. But if there's a trio, there's more room for it, you know? It's a bit of messing in a way. So you're you're definitely one of the busiest bass players I've seen. Like In Cork, you seem to be playing with all the big names in Cork. Like, so I don't know how you juggle all the tours, but at the moment, that's not really a problem. <laughs> but when no. When busy, it might be a problem. Yeah, uh, I've been lucky um, in that, we we'll say, at the busiest time, I was. it was rare that I would have, you know, two gigs that would clash. Like, um, we'll say, well, I was really busy with Mark O'Reilly and it was rare that him and a mixing would clash maybe once or twice 
where I couldn't do one or the other, but mostly it was, you know, one tour would finish and another tour would start or something like that, which is unreal. Like it's so handy, but um, yeah, I guess it was just lucky. And uh, that could be a disaster. It, like it could be like you'd be like, oh, we're going to America, and then some other band wants you to go to because you did a lot of kind of touring in in Europe with Mark O'Reilly, wasn't it? Kind of. Yeah, we did. Um, over the years, we did uh, like loads of tours in the UK, all around the UK. Um, uh, that was kind of first off mainly around the UK, and then after a couple of years, we did uh, like we would do like two months in Germany and Holland and then we did one tour of like uh, through the like the Balkan countries so like uh, started in uh, northwest Italy through Slovenia and we went through like Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Kosovo, Romania. How did, that come, how did that come about like a, a tour like that? It's a bit um, random like usually you have you know, UK, Germany for Irish bands, yeah. maybe France, but they don't really go down there very often. No, no, I, I guess um, just through different agents, you know, uh, Mark is some good, really good agents that just got in touch with a dude in those countries who uh, runs tours. So he wanted to bring us. So he, he like tour managed the whole thing, which was uh, unbelievably handy because he, he drove us. And also because he could speak the language because um, we were going through borders like every single day and there were like strict borders where you'd have to have all your paperwork, your IDs, all that ready. So if we didn't, if we were trying to do that just through English, I'd say mm. it would have been a complete disaster. Like uh, there was one day, uh, <laughs> I can't even remember what country you were going to or from, but let's say the gig was about half an hour away or an hour away as uh, so we left in the morning to tip away over but whatever way they wanted id and we only had passports but apparently you know all of europe they have like just like id cards that we don't yeah. have here like uh so none of us had them and they wouldn't accept the passport so we had to go instead of just driving an hour over this way we had to go back through the country and through another border so it was like a night it made into a nine hour journey oh jesus yeah so we we just about made stage time like you know five minutes sound check or whatever for the gig oh it was uh that was uh, hellish you're, you're laughing whatever. you're laughing about it now but it probably wasn't very funny at the time no no tensions were fairly high when we got on stage <laughs> yeah. and you know you had the, the venue like uh, the rep or the owner or whatever of being like yeah you know come on you're late and you're like yeah you know we know <laughs> leave yeah. me alone like we just we've just been nine hours in the car like <laughs> that's some that's some trip i actually did a nine hour trip within ireland once we had a we played in Dun <laughs> Fa- Dun <laughs> you go we- go around twice <laughs> <laughs> no, we played in Dunfanny, which is the top corner of donegal and we had to do a, a wedding reception for a fan in skibbereen or in the next oh. day so it was kind of like transverse the whole yeah country. it took nine hours it was fucking mental did you drive down after the gig or something was it uh no in the morning we got up really early oh. and then just hit the road and we arrived just in time to do the the wedding reception but it was very relaxed oh. he wasn't expecting like a big full energy cbc show it was just <laughs> a bit of music yeah, yeah. where people are eating their cakes and drinking tea after the wedding kind of thing <laughs> just as well yeah, but that's cool. I, I, I'm what's the, the rock crowd down that part because we play in Spain a bit and they're f- yeah. amazing. The audience is they're just like gagging for gigs and they kind of treat every band like they're a famous rock band coming to town, regardless of who yeah. they are. Like, yeah, it's kind of the same out that way as well. Um, we had some amazing gigs there, uh, and yeah, they're actually really into the rock as well. Like, so, um, you know, within the set, kind of goes for, on Mark stuff, goes for everything from. You know, he might do a couple of songs on his own, just on acoustic, and then to full on like riffage and you know tearing into it. So and they love it. Like, yeah, I was listening to one of your songs. Um, what was it Enemy of? I think it's off. Oh yeah, yeah, the new album. And I was hearing a bit yeah. of kind of Colin Greenwood in your playing. Would he be kind of someone you'd be the Radiohead um, bass player, or is that just uh, a coincidence? No, uh, that was actually Mark played that himself on that. Oh album. really? But. Having said that, uh, I do love Colin Greenwood, and I think he's, uh, I think he's unbelievably underrated. Because I was listening to your playing on another on what was it, 
one of the one of the good ones um one of mixed oh, yeah. songs and yeah, you're yeah. doing this kind of wobbly bass sound i was wondering how you got yeah. it and it was also colin greenwood sounding that yeah went on like um i guess uh it, it, it's kind of a filtery thing that um it was christian christian best so he plays drums with mick and he also records the majority of mixed music and produces so he like we would have had when we were recording the idea that it was going to be some sort of filter or effect on the bass because it's kind of a repetitive kind of chugging part or whatever mm. and uh so he would have gotten that sound uh he's pretty cool like that like the you know if he can kind of get out there and get weird with it he's he's happy you know what i mean yeah mixed records are really interesting like if you only knew Mick from seeing him maybe an RT, it's a lot of that, you know, the piano stuff. But when you, mm. the albums have loads of really interesting textures and they sound amazing, like. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, I guess you could have preconceived notions. Uh, you know, anything that the, the kind of tag singer-songwriter is put onto someone, yeah. it, can, it can put people off, you know, if you just think of a guy or a girl with a guitar that are just kind of singing. Yeah. But like, you know, if you listen to obviously a lot of mixed records are, you know, a lot more complex and you say lots of textures, lots of cool stuff going on and loads of other things are saying is the same, you know, like uh uh like David Case or Lisa Hannigan or whatever, they what's going on in their albums is unbelievable, you know. It's not mm. just one fellow with a guitar, you know, singing about the fucking birds or whatever <laughs> yeah well i suppose what happens is when they do a gig live it's easier to get across well if they're on their own they can only put the songs across one way yeah on the al- but the album sound amazing your man the drum the drum sound is always class yeah he's a great producer i'm surprised he's not like working with i suppose he does work with some big nate max but it's top class sound and the albums are really good like yeah the drums are deadly uh, obviously being a drummer himself he has all sorts of stuff in the studio, like loads of different old vintage kits, like Ludwig's and all sorts of stuff, and loads of cymbals, snares. Uh, um, he, Christian, also recorded and produced uh, Mark's last two albums. So uh, that one that Enemy of is on, and the one before that, Morality Mortality. So there's some daily drum sounds on that too, like. So you spend um, a good bit of time in in that Monique Studios, is that what it's called? Yeah, Monique Studios. Yeah, um, yeah, have done over the years. Yeah, just with different people. Um, that's how I kind of met Christian first. I was recording there with uh, different bands, and he in his old studio, and um, that's how I got to know him from being in there with different people. And then he, I guess he kind of maybe suggested me for the Mick gig. Then, so it all, you know, kind of came about serendipitously like that. Like, is that a word? Serendipitously. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's a film with Sandra Bullock as well. Terrible film. But <laughs> good, it's a good word. <laughs> but, uh, what, what, what were your base beginning? Because we actually have a, one thing in common. My main base I bought in Crowley's. And I think, I don't know, is it still, do you still own that base you bought? For anyone who doesn't know, like Crowley's is, well, you tell them, you're the well, card man. Was it's, it's was a burger, it's yeah. a burger place now, but it was the burger place now. Um, unfortunately, uh, even though it's a good burger place, but it's not. Uh, who needs? Who me- cares about good burgers when you're losing the music you, shop? There's a lot of fucking burger places around the place all of a sudden. But um, Crowley's was kind of the hub uh, for you know music shops in Cork. Like it was, um, you would just go in there, and it was like a proper old-fashioned music shop where you'd have people just hanging out you know chatting about say oh, i went to this gig or i saw this day and just hanging out you know talking maybe playing cards maybe buying stuff maybe buying strings whatever um and you know was, that's where i think the 90 percent of people that i know anyway used to go you know for all their mm-hmm. music stuff and crowley's is great as well like if you if you ever needed to borrow stuff you know, if say, oh fuck, you know, my my aunt is broken, or whatever, they'd gladly give you one. That kind of thing is is uh, less and less now, you know. Yeah. So unfortunately, closed down a couple of years ago. But Sheena Crowley, um, the daughter of Mick, who opened the shop, she's still uh, around Cork, and you can get in contact with her on Facebook. And she is, she has kind of loads of instruments and stuff in her gas. So you know, she's got loads of guitars and mandolins and ukuleles and stuff like that or all sorts 
So if you've got in touch with her, she'd gladly hook you up with something, you know. And of course, it's famous because it's where Rory Gallagher bought his famous strat. That's kind of yeah thing, like yeah, yeah, sure. You know, in Cork, Rory is just like Jesus, you know, <laughs> and yeah. especially in Carl, he's like oh yeah. They used That's... to put they used to put on gigs in there as well. I forgot mm. I forgot to say that um, the small gigs and they were it was unreal. Like you know, just pre in sort of go in and you'd have the band sing in there all the time just because everybody loved the shop so much that the bands were happy to go in a gig there and just have the crack like oh yeah I did one but she was so generous what we were doing it like for the crack and she mm. was like she wanted to give us a few bob and she was feeding us and giving us everything and I was like oh, she man. was so generous like unbelievable yeah yeah and the lads that worked in there as well um, uh, Trevor and Shane and I think Mick and stuff they were just legends of fellas as well like in great musicians themselves as well so they were always very helpful you know and just and good crack as well like it was just a good spot like yeah the whole music shop thing is just gone i think the only way a music shop could work now is if it's a cafe as well because you know most of the time you don't buy it when you go in but if you ever time yeah. you went in you're buying a coffee and a cake or something they'd be they'd yeah. be making more than they would on the strings and stuff that that could be a good yeah. model for a music shop going forward like yeah um it's a shame, isn't it? Like, I suppose the internet kind of fucking wiped all that out because they just, the small places just can't compete, like, with the prices of, you know, Coleman or whatever, mm. which is fair enough. But and they, even when they try and match it, I suppose the convenience of just buying stuff from your gas, people just love that, you know? Yeah. And what, what was the base? So what age were you when you went in? Was it you went into Crowley's, like, and just picked up a yeah. base? Yeah. Well, I, my brother, my older brother, he had acoustic guitar at home. And he was saying that, and he kind of showed me the few a few things. But I, I guess I just like bass or whatever from whatever music I was listening to. So I would play, pick it up and play it, just you know, plucking. And uh, so I, after a little while of that, um, I decided I wanted to get a bass. So you know, my man brought me up and got me as <laughs> the the square the starter pack. It was a square white it was all white p bass and a little fender uh old fender uh bxr practice amp which is actually a deadly thing i have no idea where it is i have no idea where either of those pieces of gear are and i've been trying to pr- track down that little lamp for ages because it's very handy to have a small practice yeah, yeah. Amp, and i have no idea where it is and none of my friends like you know the with your buddies you'd be lending gear or whatever and none of them know where it is but you're back in the day like you'd be getting up to such uh, i remember I had a a, a Zoo multi effects pedal that was cool, and we were, we were it jamming was it. It B three or something was it? No, not that one. That I, that's a new one I got, an older one. So it was it was weird, not great sounding, but some effects were useful. But we used practice on my parents' farm, and we we'd be drinking as well as you would when you're that age. And for one, yeah. re- I think I had an argument with the lads or something, and he he didn't tell me, but he buried my fucking Zoom pedal in the sand outside the farm. <laughs> it's actually over there. I see it. It's. It, I found it years later, but it doesn't work. But the cunt, he put it in, <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> he buried it in the sand. It's like, why did you do that? And he just said, I don't know. We were drinking and sure, I, yeah, we do stupid things. <laughs> sound. <laughs> yeah, sound. I, I, I and no, no money to buy another one later, like, because you were probably, you know, 15 or 16. Like, oh, no, that was, I'd blown my wad on that multi effects pedal. Yeah. <laughs> But what, yeah, did, yeah. did did you get like lessons or was it like self taught from there? Like, I uh, know I got lessons as well. Uh, so um, after I got the bass and uh, I got lessons first off a guy um, based in in Plan in Clonakilty. He's based and he used to travel around. He came to he used to come to my house. No, no writing was it? T- teaching you? Yeah, bass. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, fucking hell! Uh, a guy called uh, Duncan Lott. He's actually uh, English, but well, living in Clan, in, involved in that Clan scene, like with um, John Fitz. Uh, I don't know if you know him. Uh, he's running a studio down there. All the kind of Debar's head. Oh, yeah. I, I know the and, Debar's um, people. Yeah, yeah. Well, back in the day. So he's a great player. So he used to come and uh, give me lessons and really good. But then I think I stopped getting lessons for a while. Then, you know, the way when you're younger, like, ah. I don't need any more lessons. Did he, did he go in? Was it more than just, here's how to play songs? Was he teaching like theory and good yeah. technique and all the proper stuff? Like, Yeah, yeah. Kind of, uh, he would do it through 
kind of he would pick songs that maybe had techniques within them you know and show you say this is in this song and this is why they do it you know what i mean mm. you know like um i remember him uh, telling me about i think it was you know um you know walking the wild side you know just start yeah, that yeah the, yeah yeah well it's, it's two bases or whatever but basically you know where you play the your third you know you play something on the east ring you play the third an octave higher yeah ten, the tenth, on the yeah. yeah 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 he showed me that very early on and it's something that i always use now like you yeah know, i actually I only i out, only like, figured it out like y- later into my playing but they just said they sound amazing those tents on the base you can just use oh, them I so do. much like i do it all the time yeah i heard all you doing time. it on the on some of the records i was listening i heard you yeah. <laughs> slipping them in there yeah. yeah they're cool um so i got lessons from him for a while he's really good and then a bit later i got lessons from a dude called Mark O'Leary in Cork City, who was actually uh, an crazy good jazz guitar player. Like, he's on YouTube. He's, like, way, like, unreal jazz fusion sort of stuff. But he he was teaching, um, he kind of taught me more theory stuff as well, you know. Uh, so I was going to him for a while. Not so much technique, but, um, yeah, kind of theory and, and songs and stuff like that. So that was cool. But I haven't had lessons in quite a while but I'd like to go back and get a few maybe there's a few heads in court that are just great players I'm, get, I'm getting lessons in. at the moment off Noel Barrett and he's a fe- a absolutely class teacher so <laughs> a shout out to Noel yeah. there he really yeah. getting so much out of it like it's brilliant like yeah yeah Noel is a legend I definitely like to go and hang out with him and get a few uh, lessons off him because he's just and he's gas man as well. Yeah, so something I've Very got fresh. into. I got into that lockdown. I got lessons off Anthony Mutaraja as well, and I hadn't got lessons in nearly ten years, like since I was a teenager. Yeah. Like, you know, did you ever watch him on YouTube? Um, no, jazz guy. So I, I, I enjoyed that. It was heavy stuff. So I said, you know, I'll, I'll keep doing this. Like, it's, it's, it's definitely. Where, where's like, he based? Uh, Dubai. He lives in. It was Zoom lessons. So it's oh, cool. Through Zoom, I was actually he, he was very cheap. Like the lessons. For like you know someone who's kind of established on yeah. YouTube, but I definitely recommend it to anyone listen. Like even if you don't have to go going to lessons, isn't just for when you're a teenager. Like you get so much no. out of it. Like no, I've been meeting for years to get a couple of lessons, but you know you forget about it. But the, I would like to go to Noel, and there's a few other. Uh, I got it. Um, I got into double bass in the last year or so, and mm. I had a. I just went for one lesson with um, uh, this dude. Chris McCarthy in Cork, who's a brilliant uh, upright and electric bass player and a legend of a dude as well. So he uh, he gave me a few pointers and he's another fellow I'd like to go back to get a few lessons, you know. And how did you find that picking up the double bass? I thought you'd been playing it for years, like now that you're playing no, it live and everything. Like. No, um, I only got into it in the last year or so. Um, and I only bought my first one, which is me, a month ago. Um, was I it have, an expensive one? I have one there as well in the bag, but it's like a cheap five five hundred. Well, five hundred isn't cheap, but it's the cheapest you can get one of them for. No, it was, expen- years ago. it was expensive. It was expensive, right? Yeah, I took the took the plunge and got a, a fairly a decent one. It's fully carved, uh, like made in Romania. Oh my! Uh, you so know, it's the price so. price of a new car kind of job. Yeah, something like that. Uh, <laughs> Second hand car, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's worth it, you know. I, I, um, it's just a, like, pardon the pun, but it's another string to the bow. Like, uh, mm. you know, having that versatility for gigs and it's just, it's, it's class, like, you know, the sound of those bass. And especially, you know, with, uh, for mixed stuff, it's it's very useful too, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's it's hard. I'm, I'm very much only learning it at the moment and very difficult. Um, yeah, have you got some books like you're working through Sam Mandel or Rufus Reed or anything like I, that? I I got that all right, but I'm still I'm kind of just um, playing along to music and like music that I know maybe on electric, playing along to it on a double bass to just make try and get my intonation uh, natural. You know what I, I mean? I have I some here. Let me have a look. Uh, have the the Sam Mandel book and the Rufus Reed book. The Mandel is the that's like the, one, ma- the mandatory. Record. I have that, yeah. That's very good. And then yeah. another one. Uh, 
I can't find it. Uh, Rufus Reed is his name. And he kind of goes into a bit of theory, but a lot of um, techniques and stuff. So that that's a good one. But it's the kind of instrument you really have to do it, you know, for the intonation. You can't just you can't just do your own technique. You have to kind of do the the technique the no. way it's supposed to be. Yeah, uh, but until I got that one lesson with Chris with Chris McCarthy, like I said, I didn't realize that you have the like the one, two, four technique. Yeah, yeah. You, you may as well. You could cut off your ring, your third finger, your ring finger, and you wouldn't need it at all. It, like it's actually very handy because I broke my ring finger last year. So, <laughs> How did so you do that? Not, uh, pin five aside. You know. Jesus, that five aside is lethal. I know loads of musicians who've damaged their <laughs> fingers doing that. and tag rugby as well. People tag rugby, yeah. Are always breaking fingers and stuff doing that like. I definitely I did play tag rugby before, but I wouldn't do that again because that is very dangerous. But that five aside, that was just unlucky, I think. Is it because it's a bunch of like on sp- uh, people who shouldn't be playing sports trying to play sports and they're all <laughs> injuring themselves? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, I just don't want to admit that, but yeah, probably, uh, yeah, yeah. No, not you, but I mean the tag rugby. The tag, <laughs> the tag rugby thing is more of a social thing than this. They're not there for the sport most of the time. Well, like if you're trying to, you know, grab tags off people as they're running past you, mm. like it's it's bound to happen. Like, I, like I guess I don't play basketball, but I often think that that would be another one. Yeah, like people are throwing the ball to you, and like. What happened to me was I was playing in goal up at five side and I tried to I was trying to stop a shot but instead of having doing like this I kinda of went like that. Ball hit right to the top of the finger and broke it. That was my own fault, but um yeah. I still like it though. It's good for the head to get out a couple of times oh, a week, yeah. you know, I, I sprained my fingers as well in Riga years ago. I fell off a bar and sprained all my fingers. They took ages to heal, like nine months, maybe twelve months before they do aren't is your finger still a sore like? Uh, no, I had to get surgery on mine. I had to get pins in it. No way. And I was I was kind of freaking out actually because, um, you know, I saw the specialist and, you know, the way doctors often they wouldn't have the best, uh, you know, bedside manner. They wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, they, you a, know. He's like, we're going to have to take off the finger. Or something yeah, like. he's like, well, you know, I see here that you're a musician, uh, but you know, I can't guarantee that you'll have. Uh, 100% uh, capability or whatever Jesus. it is again and I just left the hospital just being like oh my god this that's is that's crazy this is, and sir it was grand it's fine it, it's fine it's not as strong as the others would say if I was playing the double bass but I don't need to and it's no. fine for the electric it's grand gee yeah that's t- that's crazy when like that happens I've always been kind of conscious to try and look after my fingers because when you're people mm. when you're out like people do weird things like they might shake your hand a, a fellow I knew before he got his fingers twisted by someone on night out. They were like shaking his hand, but they were drunk, and they and he's they all swelled up like, and he had to do a gig then the next week, and he was on like anti-inflammatories and everything. So I'm kind of you'd, you'd have to be kind, but you know, it's still a good idea to do the sports, I suppose. But you have to yeah, watch yeah. the hands, like yeah, I would know if I was uh, if I was up playing soccer or whatever, if I was standing in goal, I wouldn't exactly be killing myself if there was a ball flying into the goal. I'd say, I'll leave that off there. I don't give a shit. Like, you know. Jeez, you're not going to get picked for that team again now. They're like, oh, you're uh, uh, But you, you were, how do you switch your double bass live from, um, how, how does that work? Do you, you have to I, plug I everything? I got a, um, a radial, uh, it's called a bass bone. So basically it's a pedal that has two inputs and two like channels and uh there's on the second channel which is kind of designed for upright there is um eq on that and you can set levels on both so that they're matching and one output then goes to your amp so that when you switch the volume is the same going you know Mm. coming out of your amp and uh, there's a di out of it as well so that's class um, it's very very handy here there's just like you just one you know, switch between channels and click over to the upright. I have the upright in the stand and uh, just put the electric kind of, you either take it off if you're going to be playing a couple of songs or just, you know, put it behind your back sort of thing. Mm. I, I find it really hard to dial in a sound. I, I, I used to do a few gigs with double bass and it just mm. sounded awful, like boomy and all over the place. Do you find yeah. it hard to dial in a good sound in different venues? Like, Yeah, it can be difficult. I did... I spent a bit of time trying to get 
the EQ on the pedal right so that it's um it's not so boomy and also you know if you're working with it whoever's doing monitors to get a mix because if you have it booming in the monitors then it starts feedback so it's very it has to be very delicately balanced yeah and you're using pickups because I had a uh, Katie Chiru, a double bass player from America, on this, and mm. she would never use a pickup or use it's oh, always really? a microphone, microphone for always like. Oh, that is that is that not very problematic though? If she is she playing in bands like? Uh, she's a jazz. She sings and plays double bass in a in okay. jazz bands. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I have a pickup as well. Uh, that I got installed when I bought the bass. Pretty good. And they'd often use a mic as well. Mm. Um, I might invest on the line in one of those uh, clip-on mics, that, like a DPA. They're pretty good as well, but expensive. But it's the way to go, right? Yeah, it's nice. It, you're right, though. It is an extra string to your box. I met another a young lad in in the Cork City, and um, he's in the school of music. And he was saying he's getting mm. more, he's getting more gigs from playing double bass than anything. All kinds of stuff: yeah. singer, sing songwriter, jazz, whatever, like. Yeah, definitely. That's what I was thinking too, you know, that there's uh, not as many people playing the upright, so, you know, there's probably gigs there as well or, you know, recording or whatever. Did but you ever get into get... The, the jazz stuff, like the standards? and? Not yet. I can see it coming down the line, but not yet, no. It's not really... Uh... Jazz fest, you know, it's always a good... If you can play, you get about 20 gigs, like, around the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I... I kind of feel like if I started to get into that now, that I'd be a bit of a fraud. You know, there's definitely within this kind of jazz community, there's, they're like, I don't want to say elitist, but like, you know, there's like, oh, he's not a, he's not a real jazzer. You know what I mean? There's a bit of that, but you can get away with it. Like if, if you're, if you're doing the walking properly, it's fine. Yeah. But that's uh, even doing walking, um, to be really good at walking is hard. Yeah. Actually, you know, the, you're without being doing the same old no choices, and to to be really good at that, I find that quite difficult. You know. Yeah, it could be a bit monotonous if you're just going the same line, do do do, blah, yeah, blah, blah, do all the time. You'd want to get a bit more creative with it, like. Yeah, definitely. I, I think like probably the only way to really get good at that, obviously practicing, but is to be gigging yeah. and doing it. You know. If you, do you so ever there's, go on, sorry. There's a um, in in Crane Lane in Cork City. They have a, like a jazz jam every Tuesday with some really good musicians. Uh, uh, Paul Dunley and the trombone player is kind of his. I don't know that he leads or whatever. And uh, Davy Ryan, drummer, and a few other lads. So maybe down the line, I might build up the confidence and head up to that. But we'll see. That's a if bit. You... That's a bit away at it. <laughs> yeah. No. Have you ever, you ever watched the? Uh... Jacko when he was in the Joni Mitchell band knowing they did the High yeah. Jira album yeah. and there's a video of him walking and Michael Brecker's doing a sax solo but Jacko's lines are nuts like and your man is getting confused and it, it's really class stuff that Jacko's doing but it's completely off the wall walking and yeah. throwing in all Jackoisms and your man has been really put off trying to do his sax solo he, so he <laughs> yeah, just yeah, get, yeah. eventually just kind of starts following Jacko he's like oh but yeah, it's cool it's to no see longer it's no longer a sax solo, it's a bass solo all of a <laughs> it sudden. It kind of was getting like that. I don't think he was yeah. annoyed. I think he was just thinking, this lad is doing some pretty class stuff there. I should, we'll just leave him off. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't be annoyed when it was him, really. No, he, he's amazing. Like, what, what kind of bass players were you into when you when you started out? Like, who kind of influenced your style, would you say? Um, definitely uh, Tim Comerford's Rage Against the Machine. Um, just mainly for tone and kind of groove and uh, you know I like a lot of the lines are fairly simple but really grooving um, mm. almost kind of a less is more sort of thing you know plenty of space deep pocket um, I love John Paul Jones Zeppelin obviously yeah. uh, he's amazing like um, to be playing you know just drums and guitar and himself the kind of Supporting the song, but also putting in some really nice stuff there. That's some great bass lines. Um, two of them, I suppose, Flea as well, you have to say, you know, oh, for yeah. anybody, probably about the, we're about the same age, anybody about our age. Yeah, yeah I was into Flea as well. Absolutely loved him. Like. Yeah, um, 
not so much even the slappy stuff, but like the you know the Californication album and No Sugar, class stuff on that. Like, um, who else was there? I suppose it changed throughout the years too, you know. Yeah, then like got into Jacko and Marcus Miller, I guess when I was a bit younger, that all the slapping stuff was. Oh, you did. I you had that. your slap phase, did you? Where you were getting into that? I did, but I never really did it. Took it out in public, but I would do it at home, <laughs> all right, for sure. Like be practicing it. Yeah, it, it, everyone goes through that, like, because it sounds f- class, but. Whether you get to do that again, it's, like. it's good crack to play. I've done it live, and it's it's better even live because you've the big PA sound. But I, I kind of think that I kind I like funk music, but it's the kind of music it's more fun to play than for people to go to listen to a lot of the time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might like if I was playing a a bar gig, I might if I was really messing or whatever, I might sneak a bit of slap in there, but not really. Like you know. <laughs> I would I wouldn't get away with it on a mixed gig like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, that would be yeah. a, that would be a media P forty five, I'd say, and rightly so. <laughs> I'd say you wouldn't be the first bass player to get fired for doing a bit of slap, like so. <laughs> on the on the singer songwriter gig, yeah, r- r- <laughs> wrong wrong gig or something. But I was listening yeah, to the yeah. mic record, and you were doing um, a song called Lonely Winds, and I had like oh yeah, kind of McCartney esque kind of. Is that are you play with a pick on that and a flat one? Yeah, kind of sound? actually, yeah, I should have named Paul McCartney actually when I was talking about other bass players. Um, yeah, his uh, like loads of melody within the bass and kind of you know start at the root and you know in between the chord changes, little you know chord tones. Um, mm. Yeah, I played on that a lot on that album actually with a pick, and I have. Uh, P bass of flat flat ones, you know the the usual thing. Yeah. Um, but I've kind of really gotten into the pick thing over the last couple of years. Um, sounds really cool. Like yeah, me too. I you, think the short scale bases you see one there behind me, the red one. Um, yeah. They sound great with a pick and a bit of tremolo, even better than a P bass. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just finished watching the the Beatles doc. Oh, it's so amazing, I, isn't it? Yeah. No, no, I'm like. Uh, I know I have to buy a hustler. <laughs> he talks know. more about his bass playing in the in the other documentary with Rick Rubin. I'm gonna start that next. And he does a, they isolate his bass parts a lot, and mm. they really talk. And they talk about the tone. And on oh, um, cool. on uh, what's the song? When my guitar gently weeps. There's actually loads yeah. of gain on the bass, and it's quite yeah, distorted. Did he play bass on that? Was it? I think he did. There's some kind of mystery, isn't there, about that so, so, that song? Yeah. I... I was thinking that it might have been even uh, like John on the Fender Six or something because it's such a cool sound, like really thick, um, kind of distorted. Yeah, and he pl- it uses double stops on it as well, like the kind mm. of power chord thing. Um, yeah, McCartney's a beast. Uh, and how does that work going into studio? Do you like bring a lot of different bases and you have kind of the songs down for with Mick for practicing for months, or are you just go into uh, studio no. and lay down whatever? Yeah, usually uh, I go in and I bring, I have the P bass with flats and I have a Lakeland uh, jazz bass with uh, uh, nickel ones or whatever. Um, so I go between the two of them and usually it's the P bass that you know, people always want. And yeah. I wouldn't usually have the songs before we go in it would just be on the day this is the song this is the way it goes and we would just maybe go through it a couple of times yeah that recording and um, with the last album the Mick and Susan's duet album it was really cool actually we got to it was during one of the lockdowns but when you were allowed to we could go we were allowed to go to the studio but myself and Mick and Susan Christian and Alan Comerford the guitar player we did a lot of the tracks live in the same room which was mm. deadly like we spent a couple of days in that it was so cool especially in the middle of lockdown no gigs and everything so that's class, that a great yeah. buzz great buzz that's a great way to do it like it's that we've done it that way as well it's it's more you know natural isn't it to do it depends on the type of music i suppose but for definitely what you're doing i think it would suit it like yeah it definitely um you just get i it, maybe it's easier to do the uh, recording when it's individually but I feel like you get definitely get better performances from 
especially bass and drums, when it's done live, that you're actually playing together, maybe with guitar and definitely vocals, you know, you can overdub, whatever, but for bass and drums, performance, if you can do it live, it's, it's the way to go. If you can, but it's not always possible. Like, uh, What's the other guy you play with? Uh, Ariel Poseidon? Is that what you say his uh, name? Uh, Ariel, Ariel Posen, yeah. Yeah, he's he's, um, he's big like guitarist, and he lives in Cork. I've never seen him around he, the city. He li- he lived in Cork, um. So, yeah, he's a Canadian uh, guitar player, singer songwriter. He moved to Cork a couple of years ago. His wife was in uh, working, or she was studying UCC, and uh, he was kind of like he was well known within within Canada, and he got here and. Yeah, he um, so he moved to Cork, and I suppose he kind of just introduced himself to a few heads, and all of a sudden, you know, he was playing all around in Cork. So I got to know him through other people, and then he so when he tours, um, he'll use different bands. Like he might use like when he's in America, like he uses a different band in every mm-hmm. city, and just send them on the set they learn. But I just did a couple of gigs with them in Ireland. Uh, usually. Um, he has uh, Owen Walsh plays bass with him, who's a, a Cork guy, mm. but he wasn't available at the time, so I did a couple of gigs with him. Um, but he's yeah, he's pretty awesome. Were, were you nervous on a gig like that with someone who's you know, it's more like a very very technical. What, wouldn't you really call him a technical guitarist, but more of an instrumentalist? Like, and would, yeah, would a gig like that make you nervous? Like, um, I guess the only time I'd ever really be nervous before a gig is if I felt I wasn't prepared. If I felt like, oh, I haven't learned these songs well enough, that I'd be nervous. But I, I, you know, I had enough time to learn the songs that I thought was grand. And then, um, because, you know, he's such a good guitar player, it's just, you know, sit back, serve the song, let him do his thing, so it was grand. You know, I didn't have to, I definitely didn't have to be matching him for, you know, solos and, and licks and all that. So it's just leave, leave him do it, you know? It's it's mad when these people move to Ireland. I, I was just saw in the paper there yesterday that Mark Lanigan lives in Kerry now. Yeah, I only found that out last month as well. It's like what he's like one of my favorite acts ever. Like, and he, he's yeah, just he, living down in Kerry. He got COVID here, and then was it? And yeah. he was really sick, and uh, it was just that people were so nice to him. He got looked after. He was like, I'm just going to stay here. Yeah, he was in a coma for like four weeks in the doctors induced the coma to try help him get over like he 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 really was close to dying like that's mental but uh yeah he was saying also if he had got sick in america he'd be in debt for the rest of his life so he's like yeah they looked after me in ireland and i'm not in debt for the rest of my life sure this is a grand place <laughs> so he's gonna stick around apparently class sure i could see him getting played in like the bars or anywhere like st luke's in the city like because yeah. so small oh. he'll just go around gigging i suppose yeah, I wonder if he needs a bass player. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Because <laughs> he's done some terrible gigs in Ireland. Not that he was terrible, but they just were like, he was at Independence Music Festival, which is oh, wow. you know, a younger crowd. Like, yes, and very he, much so. He was the opening act for Guns N' Roses at Slane. Like, like who's booking his gigs? These are like, they don't suit him at all. Like, his music needs to be appreciated, like somewhere where, you know, it's quiet and you can listen to him properly. Like, yeah, there's plenty of really good places he could be playing, and definitely not independence. <laughs> not that not that there's anything wrong with that festival, but I don't think he he would go down too well there. No. Yeah, it was probably just the people running it or fans, so they got him on it, so they could watch him himself. Which I I would do that too if I was running the festival. I'd book a few acts for myself to watch. Yeah, we've all been there though. Like uh, you know, at, booked at a festival and just we did a festival before. Uh, couple of years ago and we were playing on like the second stage it was a really cool stage and there was like a dj across the field from us and it, mm. it wasn't even a dj actually it was some band doing a dj set you know the way they do that at festivals and yeah. it was the headline act and there was just loads of kids over there going mental and we were playing to about five people you know <laughs> what i mean actually actually playing music was this you know. with Mick, like with the Mick? Flurry no, no, it was it was with Mark. Yeah, yeah. I I did a gig as well before, like, and we were on one of the smaller stages at the picnic, and sure, in the middle of our song, the woman running the stage just got up and started saying "Happy Birthday." That she was giving some, like, not she didn't even say, "Can I can I use the mic?" 
she just got up in the middle of our set and I was like ah, I just wanted to say happy birthday to my friend and we were just like okay sure I guess we're finished <laughs> but that but these, if, they did, if she did that these days I don't think we'd be too happy we definitely would have been like what are you doing like uh, yeah festivals hey <laughs> yeah, but they are good crack though. That's the thing. Like, we all we all give out about the you know how little money you get for playing them, but yeah, there is a certain buzz about them as well. Like, yeah, um, I I guess if you're going doing it, you kind of have to just embrace it and go. Look, we're going up, up here for the crack rather than for the gig because a lot of the time, yeah, it can be fairly, uh, it can be stressful too. Like you know, mm. just you know, lugging gear around and quick sound check depending on the size of the festival or whatever but yeah it's done picnic a few times as well and um unless you're i guess if you're on the main stage or whatever but otherwise you know you just have to put your car in the car park and walk around with your gear and yeah stuff going. it can be there used to be a festival in uh, monaghan called flat lakes and it was more oh, yeah. of an, an art and literature festival and the music was kind of secondary and it was absolutely yeah. class it was really cool the whole stage was made of books and the rubber bandits played it, but they weren't like the main band and we did it, but the the music was only secondary to all the yeah. other cool stuff that was going on. It was actually a deadly festival. Yeah. Um, we did, one of the times I did Electric Picnic, I did, we did the body and soul stage with uh, a band I was in the, for a little while called the Hard Ground. So we had a really nice slot on the body and soul stage with it kind of in this, almost natural amphitheater within mm. the festival you know it's kind of I don't yeah. know if you know it but, I know it yeah. but uh, we had a really nice slot at like six or seven o'clock so it was still kind of warm and sunny and that was really really nice that's a good highlight of electric picnic memories yeah I think we're, we're kind of talking about festivals now because it's been so long since everyone's played one like I'd say yeah uh, we're supposed to be doing the Rory Fest now in um, June it's have you ever been to that one Donegal yeah it's, it's a really, I've never been no it's mad mad festival have you done that a few times? I oh, a bunch of times, yeah. Well, I go to it every year. It's one. It's the only oh, festival yeah. I go to as a punter because it's kind of just mad crack. It's it's like the flat hole, but with rock music. There's yeah there's music in every bar and just a bunch of you know Rory nice. fans going nuts. Like nice. I um yeah. I, there's plenty of great festivals out there. I don't know if you've ever been to or done the Doolin Folk Festival. No, never know. That is that's brilliant really really good i've done that a couple of times and um, so it's all kind of within this this kind of big hotel in the middle of Doolin. there's a big courtyard they set up a big marquee is the, the main stage and then there's a second stage uh kind of within i suppose it's actually within the hotel but um that's really really good as well very well run great crack and then like in the bar in the bar of the hotel there's kind of trad sessions going on all the time it's really good Doolin is tiny like what is there about four yeah. or five pubs in the whole t- little village yeah. yeah yeah it's good though it's worth the check uh, checking out yeah uh, and what have you got coming up have you is it have you your other the Mick Flannery band seems to be more active than the other bands you're in at the moment yeah uh, Mark is kind of I suppose on a bit of a hiatus um, he uh, he's kind of concentrating on his uh, like career as opposed to music at the moment but uh, you know, he I'd say he'll get the itch eventually again to mm. go out or whatever. But yeah, Mick, um, the mix up has definitely been busier with the release of the Duets album in the last year. Um, so we were lucky, kind of, we did a lot of gigs there on from the 22nd of October when like, you were allowed to do gigs again up to uh, now the middle of December. We did a lot of gigs around Ireland and we were lucky to get away with doing that without any of them being cancelled. Um, Mick and Susan themselves then have been doing tours around Europe, just the two of them, you know. Mm. Um, we're kind of quieter now, just at the start of the new year, but I think maybe closer to summer again, there'll be more stuff to uh, talk about going um, to Europe or Canada as well, so we'll see. You've been to the States touring with one of the other bands, have you, before? Um we, I was in the States with Mark for a short while. We did the um, you know, Folk Alliance. I don't know if you know that. No, no, no. So, uh, yeah, it's a big, like, uh, folk, I suppose folk, uh, it, you know, trad and all sorts of music uh, kind of conference. It's mental. It, it changes city every year. And the year we went, uh, it was in Kansas City. 
So it's all within this huge hotel, this massive hotel and um, hundreds of bands. So they have like during the daytime, they have uh, talks and conferences and they do like proper gigs within the kind of ballrooms and stuff. And then at nighttime, a couple of floors of the hotel are given over and every second or every second or third hotel room is changed into a little venue. Oh, class. And the gigs start at midnight and go until 4 a.m. So you're walking along uh, like a normal hotel corridor and mm. there could be like a six-piece bluegrass band like going hell for leather in a hotel room and, you know, 20 <laughs> people inside there dancing and then go down a couple of rooms and there'd just be a singer-songwriter in there. So, yeah, that was great crack. Yeah, the Americans are brilliant for supporting. Maybe they're, it's like this to everyone, but the, the Irish acts, when they come over, they just... They go nuts for them. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah, they're they're pretty good, alright. We um, so the, we did that uh, a good few years ago. Great crack, got to meet a lot of very cool people. Um, and then just before I suppose COVID was it the winter, the, the November before COVID, we myself and making Christian and Alan, where we did a little kind of West Coast tour of America. So that was nice. Started nice. in Seattle. And I ended up in LA, like did like uh, Portland and um, a couple of small places in Oregon and San Francisco. Uh, stopped off, like made a flight detour to um, Boulder in Colorado and ended up in LA. That was really, really cool. Sick. And I say you got up to some crack on that. That's, that's class. No, 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 no. It was very quiet. It was uh, very quiet. Was it just all of you in one van, that kind of proper job? Like, yeah. We had uh, <laughs> we uh, rented a uh, what are they called uh, a fucking space wagon or we had no the, what's the what's the I can't I'm blanking on it no the one that all the rappers used to drive you know remember MTV cribs and they'd be like showing yeah, the yeah. cars is it the suburban yeah I think it might be one of those big massive kind of jeeps blacked mm. out jeeps oh class um. Yeah, it was good crack cruising <laughs> along on that, like down the freeway. And we just had um had the gear in the back, yeah. Like you would have back line, you know, in every place, like mm. amps or whatever. So we had our guitars and uh we actually uh, Christian actually bought uh, a little kit over there, like a drum kit when we got yeah. there, so we had that in the back and yeah, it was good crack. <laughs> did he bring the kit home like or did he just leave it there? No, he left it over there with a friend, uh so just over there I don't know what, yeah, I don't know if he sold it on since or what the story is but it's, it's very different anyway. touring there isn't it because when you're on the freeways all there's all cool stuff to see like there's cool yeah. kind of niche weird little shops and restaurants and it, it's a bit more exciting than touring in Europe like yeah it was mad it was great crack um, we we were very lucky we had one day we had a day off and we were in Oregon and sure we didn't even realise that we were in the middle of in Oregon, there's a um, low. It's big for winemaking, mm. so we were just cru- we were cruising along, and then we we're seeing all these signs for a vineyard here and vineyard there. And we're like, we're so we stopped off into a little vineyard and had a, a wine tasting. <laughs> you so fell out of the van for the gig, then you fall out. <laughs> no, there was no gig that night. Oh, okay, the day off. nice. But, and also, we did have a driver. I should say that, you know. So before everyone's been gone that we were just driving around America yeah, on the piss that no I had a driver alright you weren't you were on the piss but someone else was driving <laughs> it was a wine tasting it wasn't on the piss <laughs> that's class yeah no you get to, there's some nice experiences over there like and you meet great characters as well we yeah the, actually the high, we all agreed that the highlight of it was um, so we played in Portland which you know is obviously like super cool and hip or whatever but the next gig we had was in a place in Oregon in the same state called Willa Mina, which never heard of it. Uh, so we got there, a small little town, like, um, you know, like two bars and a, a little hotel. And we had a gig there and like the whole town came out and we had a blast there. We were there for two nights. Um, it was great crack, really cool people. And, you know, like really small, like not even a proper venue, really just kind of a back room mm. of a hotel. It was class, like, and, uh, you know, that's that's more like I suppose seeing what America is like rather than you know when you're in a city. I guess all cities are kind of the same, really. Yeah, they're the they're same, homogenous, you know? like they're all just they're, the same. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, yeah. And um, we um, 
yeah, we finished up in LA. So that was cool. We had a gig there and sure it was over early enough. So we got to go to the comedy store afterwards and Brilliant. see a bit of stand up and hang out. Yeah, it was deadly. Hang out with Joe Rogan and the lads. <laughs> yeah, I missed him that night now, but uh, there was a few other heads around there. It was great press. That's, yeah, you do. So they do have gigs in random spots. I was over there and we did a gig outside, like at some kind of barbecue place, and there was these giant bugs. It was on a lake, like, and they were so mm. big, they were actually making the symbols splash when they landed on them. It was like, psh, 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 these big, huge jokes. Like, where, where was that? Somewhere in Texas. Like, I, I have no idea where in Texas. <laughs> That's deadly. And then we were um, driving into New Orleans, and um, the drummer was like, you need to take a leak, like. So we got out to take a piss and there was a spider the size of my hand, like just looking at him, ready to take a chomp out of him. It's like, oh, fuck it. I'll hold it till we get somewhere where there's actually somewhere going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't spent any time in the kind of southern part of the states with that, that I really like to uh, go to New Orleans and uh, Texas and Mississippi and Alabama. And that would be cool. Nashville, I guess, as well, yeah. Yeah, they have a lot of those random kind of juke joints and places just yeah. out there in the sticks that put on music that in Ireland just wouldn't happen. You know, there's that those kind of venues are gone. We used to have um, in Myrtleville. Do you remember that? Yeah. Place? Yeah. That was kind the, of like Pine that. Pine Lodge. Pine Lodge. It was kind of a, a, a rule onto its own, like this kind of mad venue in the middle of nowhere. Like. Yeah, it was It's kind of. A, it was kind of a weird, creepy place, but in a cool way. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. I played there a few times already. Yeah, there's less and less of the, those places in there where that are willing to put on bands of all sorts and just leave them at it, you know? Yeah, it's just like some some places like that, they just don't give a shit and they're like, okay, I know the locals aren't really into this, but if we put yeah. on the gigs, the locals will come in anyway. And that's the way it was. It was like they were just coming in and drinking in the bar and they might yeah. watch the band, they might not. That's what it's like, I feel like, in... Uh, in Germany and in Holland, it, you know, in the smaller places, they just put on gigs and like th- those are often the places where you'll have the best audiences because, you know, if it's on in the town, people come out regardless. Mm. Whereas I, I think in Ireland, it, that doesn't really happen. It's like, no, nah, I haven't bothered, you know, if there's a gig on, it's not art. Like, yeah, it just and, it doesn't happen at all. The Germans are mad though for the merch. It's like, you don't yeah. realize until you get there and the queue for the merch stand, you're like, what is going on? Like everyone who came yeah. to the gig wants to buy something. Yeah. And vinyl. They love the vinyl. Just, uh, yeah, you've fired it out to them. But, um, yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, I, I always really enjoy touring there because you get looked after so well, you know, like you arrive and there'll, there'll be probably a bit of food like for you when you arrive before sound checking and afterwards there's like dinner is provided and, they just get really well looked after, you know, Germany, Holland. Yeah, you like Holland. on most bands, writers, like not like ridiculous writers, like brown M&Ms, but they'd have like a good dinner. Like, but then yeah. in Ireland, they'll give you a pizza. But in Germany, they actually will give yeah. you a proper dinner, like homemade kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really nice. Uh, a lot of the time, yeah, they'll, they'll really look after you. You kind of feel important, you know. <laughs> it's nice yeah to get the the star treatment we found out over there like yeah. we played one big venue and we would have been like we were chancing our arm getting in there but buddy guy and everyone had played there and your mm. man, I, we were saying after to your man jesus you really looked at thanks so much for looking after us and he was just like every band is the same to me like he he didn't yeah care. he treats them all the same like yeah 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 it's cool it, I, yeah it always if there was a tour of uh, of Europe announced I'd always be I'd be fairly happy with it because you know you're going to be looked after like uh, and gear wise you don't use much effects I saw you were posting up a few kind of chorus pedals and stuff on your Instagram uh, are you mm. into the effects much or you just kind of have a few like stomps no, uh, no I have I have a bit I, I I'm into it but I suppose the chance to use them is is not that much I have a couple of things that I um I have a a vol- boss volume pedal, which I actually think is really handy for kind of uh, swells and stuff. Like I that. have so many pedals, and that's one I don't have. What 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 would you use that for as a bass player? Like, uh, I I just think swells, you know, mm. like um, yeah, it's really cool. I I use that a lot. And, and the singer songwriter kind of music, you find that useful? Yeah, yeah. If not so much if there's if there's drums, but like you know, parts of the song where there might not be drums, you can kind of come in and out of a note and just like almost like 
if you were using a bow on a double bass or something like that. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, stuff like that. Uh, so you have one of them. I have the the Boss OC2, the one that everyone wants. The original. Have one of the, I have one of them for years. And no, I didn't they're worth, even they're worth a bit. They're worth a bit now, like the, that one. Yeah, I didn't know they were so coveted. So I have one of them. It's it's a classy open fairness. Mm. It's really cool. It has that sound, you know. So I do use that as well. You can kind of sneak that in there without even people even realizing, you know. Mm. I might use that at the if at the end of a song or whatever to really, if you're really kind of going for a certain section, st- stick that on and it, you know, takes things up another level. Um. So I have that. I got a. I've always been on the search for the perfect overdrive pedal. You know, the one like that won't cut out the bottom end, but you know, and isn't too fuzzy. So mm. I have a couple actually. Um, I got this one in the states a couple of years ago, uh, made by Audio Source is the company. Um, I can't remember what the actual pedal is called. It's a bass distortion pedal. I think maybe called Earthquake or something like that. Mm. But that's re- it's really really cool as well because you have, you know. There's like three different settings. There's like a fuzz setting, a tube setting, and I think it's called heavy or whatever. Kind of stick it on tube, and you know you get the blend. You can you can blend between the clean and your overdriven sitting. Mm. So you get you know you can go from screaming the sergeant to just a bit of overdrive, and often just a bit of dirt is kind of what I like. So I use one of them. I also bought a old Ibanez tube screamer, and that's cool for it's kind of like if you step on that, you, you, you kind of lose all your bottom end, yeah. which can be, which can be cool too. L- you know, I, kind of a lo-fi sound. Yeah. So I use that a bit for the cracks as well. I think it's pretty cool. Um, what else do I have? I have a few other things. Oh yeah. That chorus pedal is a, a, another Ivan is a CS9. It's a nineties Japanese one. It's really, really nice. It just has speed and width. So you, again, you can kind of go full on 80s or just a little bit. Um, yeah. That's really nice too. Yeah, just to, to add a bit of color. So they're the kind of main ones. I have another few, uh, like I have, um, you know, then the micro pog. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. You can do yeah. some crazy stuff with that. Yeah. So I have one of them. I never, I never get to use it mm. within any band setting, but I, it's cool. Um, or I have the. the the baseballs, you know, the the envelope filter thing as well. Yeah, the, the, the thing about envelope filters, they sound crap until you put a fuzz in front of them. So you kind of have to buy yeah. two pedals to get, if you just buy yeah. it on its own, it's not really that useful. Like The, the envelope filter is kind of, it's like the slap base of the effects world. It's yeah. cool when you're at home on your own, but then if you <laughs> if you did it on a gig, people are like, the hell are you doing yeah there's a there, it's not the most popular effects I, I don't think i've ever used it live but i've used it just making little skits little small videos for instagram but yeah it's it, yeah, yeah i have that pedal and i've never used it live no but way. i didn't like i actually have had the baseballs i didn't like it at all but i have the ebs um envelope filter oh, yeah and it's better like because it's it's you can control it more so it doesn't have to be as bootsy collins you could reel back the bootsy collins kind of sound out of it like yeah that's what I go with for effects anyway. Uh, so mainly overdrive and the octave is the kind of, they're the main two for me. And I think that's probably as much as I'd get away with within the, you know, the the confines of uh, like a singer songwriter gig. Like. <laughs> uh, well, the the stuff you do with Mark O'Reilly is rocking. So once that yeah. thing starts again, you could, you might get in the, the baseballs or the, the pog thing. You might fit it in. I do use the pog for one, like a bar of one song with Mark Ray, so that justifies the uh, the purchase there of that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not, I like, you learn how to use them kind of on the gig more musically, like you're, if you, that's why I, I have the HX Stomp, which is an amazing bit of gear. Oh yeah, it's everyone's a, talking about them these days. It is amazing, but then I wouldn't really like just to have one box for my whole gig because you can't be as creative, like, because when you're on a gig, you might go, sh- I'll fire on the chorus for a bit or mm. you stomp, you kind of be, you, you mess around with them like they're like a palette of sounds, but I don't, I, I don't, can't imagine myself being able to do that with the HX, like, because you have the set yeah. sounds made, like. Yeah, I suppose that's a good point of what you say about you learn as on the gig because we'll say, for instance, with, with Mark and with Mick as well, like some gigs, it might be just, 
it could might be just a trio like just me and Mark and the uh, drummer Peter or it could be a five piece with keys and another guitar player mm. so when it's just a trio I kind of I can use the effects more to kind of fill it out like yeah. whereas when there's a five piece, five piece, I don't use them at all and just leave the lads, you know, fill it out then. Yes, yeah, because it's too and muddy. Same, like, you know. same, with, same with Mick as well. Like that we could be anything from a three piece up to seven or eight, you know, with keys and violins and stuff uh, and brass. So, yeah, it's good to have them, I suppose. Yeah. And what's the story with that stamp thing? Is that is that the one now that people are using and then they're just like not using amps? Yeah, you, you can um, you you get like a program with it for your computer, and you can make all the effects in that. And you could, yeah, you could get away without having an amp for. Well, a bass player can get away without having an amp anyway, really, can't we? Like, cause, at, you know, you're at a big gig, the amp is kind of. Can, your you, can you go? Yeah, I think you can. Well, the monitors sound terrible. If you have something to start out the monitoring situation, like. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, I see why people would want to do it, but no, I'd always want to have an amp. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, you want to be immersed in it. No, I, I haven't said that. I don't use in ears, so I guess if you were using in ears, you could really get away without it because you're, in, you know, you have it all dialed in there. Yeah, like I like using. You know, when you're at a festival and they give you the fridge, the eight by ten. Oh yeah. But the oh, rest yeah. of the band don't like it. They're like, that thing is a beast. We can't hear. And I'm, I, I'd have it on like point five or one. Yeah. But it's still like. Phew, but you can't beat it yeah. either. It's unreal crack, having it? We we did a, a festival a good number of years ago in England and they had, we played on the main stage, a big enough stage, and they had the fridge, but it was the, the Aguilar one, the Aguilar 8x10 with their, with their big head, the DB750 mm. or whatever true thing, and that thing sounded amazing. That was the nicest bass rig I've ever played through. And and once you yeah a bit of distortion once you kick that in like it's just in, your pants oh. actually shake like I didn't I thought that I yeah. didn't know that was a thing but it's mad yeah. it actually does move your clothes like yeah yeah that's um that's real self indulgence there that you only get away with it now and again you know on a big stage but it is nice yeah yeah you can't beat it but um yes I, I know this is the Christmas episode so I have happy oh. Christmas I missed I didn't get one out in November I have my I have my Christmas tree here. Right next to me. Nice. That that's great. Yeah. And you have your bases and stuff. You you might you could put some lights on the double base for Christmas. Wrap them around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just make it into a really expensive piece of furniture. Yeah, well, that's what mine was for a long time. It was I left it in my mother's house till I had somewhere to put it. And she was sorry to see see it go. Like it looked great in the living room. Like yeah, it does look good. I'm kind of lucky because I, I have you know I've got instruments all around the place like that space is in the cup like well, just be careful with it on those stands because mine has been knocked twice the first time apparently the cat knocked it i was told and i put a, a hole in the side but then the second time my jumper was under the stand and i lifted up my jumper and i snapped the, the neck off i the scroll i snapped it off oh. the base like now uh, what kind of stand was this it's a good one a k&m like quality oh yeah no i got one of the hercules ones it's fairly sturdy now i have to say um, but yeah, yeah, definitely be very careful with this kind of because it's so new as well. And like, I managed to fix it. Like, I glued it back together, and it's still fine. Like, but Jesus, you, you'd nearly cry yeah. when something like that happens. It's awful. Yeah, the guy where I bought it actually in Galway. There's um a, a, a guy there called Tom Barris, who has a double bass workshop in Galway, and he sells double bases as well. He's mm. really really nice fella. So I guess if I ever have problems, I'll just go back to him. But um, yeah, if anyone's in the market for double bass, let's check out Double Bass Workshop in Galway. He's yeah. a really, really helpful guy. Because yeah. I think, is he the guy that you can send them to and he sets it up for you as well? Yeah. Because I heard he's really good. Yeah, he'll make, he'll do a he's really brilliant. nice setup on one. Like, Yeah, the setup. I played a good few in there before I chose the one. And the setup on them were really, really good. Yeah, because mine is a, a dog to play. It's like the Toman, cheapest one you can get. And the action yeah. is huge on it, even though I brought it down a bit. Like, Yeah, if you got it set up properly, you'd be amazed, you know, at the difference. Like, It still sounds good, like, even though it's made out of plywood. So I'm sure your one yeah. sounds absolutely class and a proper it one. It sounds fairly, fairly nice. Sorry, no, it sounds, it'll be sounding even nicer now when I learn how to play properly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I missed that. I didn't get out an episode in November because so, I, I was on tour and then I got 
sick like so with the covid but so this oh, yeah. is first episode in two months so trying to keep it going hey. <laughs> yeah exactly uh, where were episode. you on tour uh just did the whole of england like so we started mm. played in london played up in grimsby which is kind of going up the north and we mm. we're, we're all over like it's tough. it's tough over there at the moment like people are really not going to shows like so there was, yeah. an, art, there was a, an article in the guardian yesterday and they were just saying no it's not just genre specific it's every genre and the venues are really struggling because people are just not going they're paying for their tickets but they're not always asking for refunds but like 40 percent of people aren't showing up to the gig who bought a ticket and they, they kind of make their money on the drink weird. and the food on the night like so it it's a weird situation like because people so a lot of people probably don't realize they're like oh sure i bought the ticket and i'll leave them have the money but the, the venue still won't survive like it without with just that. yeah that's very strange is, is, is that like a covid thing or yeah it's just after covid people are just they're changing their habits and they're just yeah they're not ours like. yeah yeah um yeah so england can be a tough tough old slog as well sometimes you know but there's some lovely venues there and obviously great people um but from what i can see people over here they might just go and play london and that's it yeah, you know, London. You I don't like know. London. Is hard one to play though. It's so big, and me and the drummer went out for a night out in London. We had the day off before our gig in the Hundred Club, so we went into Camden. Like, took us two yeah. hour. Took us two hours to get in though on the on the underground. Like, so it's it's a tough place to get people to go to a show because it's so far. Like, yeah, yeah. Like every time we play there, it seems to be in a different venue or different area. Um, it can be tough to play there with um. And like getting accommodation and all that as well. But so usually we just go over, uh, we'll do like one night to get in and get out sort of thing. No, I like playing in England, right? It's it's not too dissimilar to being at home. Like, you know, the food is no. the same and we you just stay in a travel, we just stay in travel lodges. So you're, you're pretty yeah. much in the same hotel room for two weeks in a yeah. different t- city or whatever. Like, Yeah. And I guess if you're on, you know, on the road, there's, you have all the service stations are fairly decent and all that kind of thing. Which well, is, yeah, try avoid Greg's. I found this new place last time, um, the Cornish Pasty Company. Do you ever? Yeah, like, I know. Talk, well, yeah, we're talking about like a, a massive difference to Greg's. Like this is like there. It's not even like uh, the same food. Like it's like a proper dinner. Yeah. It's it's almost like they put a full dinner into the pasty with turnips and yeah. I'd, I'd and be uh, avoiding Greg's, all right. Yeah, you get like you might get the odd nice uh, waitrose or uh, M and S food places. They're usually fairly nice as well. Yeah, you can get that, something that doesn't make you feel terrible. You know, a bit of bit of help. That's the thing at the moment being on tour, like because you you feel so shit being on tour a lot of the time. You don't know yeah. if you're what is it sick from being on tour or something else, like because it, it can be tough going. Like I well. For me, it's it's often not eating very well, and then being up late and probably drinking as well. Yeah. you know, so those combination of things is a sure way to make yourself sick or just not feel good. You know, yeah, the days off can be lethal. Me, we were we were in in um, London, and the fellow we went out drinking with put us on the bus back to Heathrow, where we were staying. And we both fell asleep on the bus and just ended up like sixteen miles from the. <laughs> And we had, I just got a taxi and your man's like, it'll be 70 pound. We are like, whatever. It's like five in the morning. I need, oh, we, need, we need to go to bed. And it was worth oh, every God. penny because it's just like, it was at that stage. But we, you don't, you wouldn't, the days off can be lethal because you get bored and you go off getting up to yeah. all kinds of shenanigans. Like, Yeah. you. I suppose when you're on tour, you nearly are better off to be gigging every night if possible. Yeah, our because booking agent does off. that. Like he he says, I have to keep you gigging, but I think he knows bands better than we know him. He's probably like, look, just keep them gigging, and it's the best thing for them. Like, yeah, we once, all right, we had it was a terrible, terrible idea, but we had a day off in Amsterdam in the middle of a tour, <laughs> so that was uh, it was good fun, but uh, hazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shook. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. <laughs> yeah, it's not worth it anyway with the hangovers. Like, and you'd find it hard no. to even perform properly. Like after all that kind of excitement of go, going drinking or whatever. Like, yeah, I do actually. I do find that um, if I was ever like hungover or tired like that, uh, that gigging is the 
the only thing that will actually make me feel better. Really? Play, yeah, playing makes me feel way better because I guess it just takes your mind off how bad you feel and mm. just the, the, I guess the endorphins of whatever we're playing by the end of the gig, you're grand. For me, anyway. Yeah, that's true. The old adrenaline gets going and yeah, you feel fine. It's really, it's really nice, yeah. yeah I've, I've never not been able to play a gig anyway, so... <laughs> no, not yet. And I, as we get older, that, that'll definitely, yeah, I'm not going to be in the same state I was when I was younger, I think. No, you need a bit of self-preservation. Um, like, we played in Leeds one time and the bar staff thought it was a great idea to give us a bottle of whiskey to celebrate playing our gig. And it's just like, I wish you didn't... After the that. gig? Yeah, yeah, after the gig. But okay. so if it happened at the moment, I would have just said, you know what, I don't actually want the bottle of whiskey. <laughs> you can keep yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can give me one, maybe. <laughs> yeah, one yeah. shot. Give me, a, give me a, give me a small drop. But that's it. Yeah, we were a couple of years ago. We were when we were on that tour in the Balkans. We were in um, uh, Sofia in Bulgaria on St Patrick's Day. Oh my that god! That was good crack on a day off. No, that was that was good crack. No, that was wholesome enough. Like um, not too like what they were looking after. Sorry, because we were Irish. They were thought it was brilliant. Yeah, we were in Barcelona for Paddy's Day once, but there, there wasn't much going on. Like they didn't really, the Span, Spanish didn't really care that it was Paddy's Day, so mm. it was just a normal gig, nothing too crazy. But it's like you said, those big cities can, are a disaster when you're on tour. Just getting around them and finding your accommodation, it can just, it's just a pain in the hole, really, a lot of the time. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all part and parcel of it. It's you know, you'd always kind of look back at it fondly, like you know, you'd have the stories, the memories. But uh, I'll have to come in and check you out in the city. Um, have you any gigs with kind of the, the cover act coming up? What What's the name of that band you're playing? Because you do like a nice set of kind of a mixture of stuff. Yeah, the, the band that I was playing with that night, uh, we call ourselves the Squonks. The what? So the Squonks. So this uh, Squonk is, um, it's taken from a Steely Dan song. They say it's a made up creature. Mm. So we call it as, um no, we are not doing that at the moment, but I have a gig every Sunday in Dwyer's in Cork with a band called the Big Swinging Mikeys, um, but that I've been in for uh, about seven years now. It's a really nice gig. So we, we um, uh, there's five piece. We kind of, there's a singer who plays acoustic guitar, piano player, drums, myself, and then every week we have different Yes, mainly electric guitar players. The odd, mm. uh, like we have a violin player that sits in with us. So that's a really nice gig every every Sunday at seven in Dwyer's. That's um, interesting. Playing every Sunday. Does it ever? Is it just something you do now? Like you, you don't get bored of it. Like it's nice to have the regular no, thing. I, yeah, I love it because um, we're always kind of trying to add new songs and. Um, it's a good outlet, I think, for everyone in the band because uh, everyone is involved in original projects and stuff. And it's kind of, uh, I suppose, I don't want to say it's self-indulgent, but because we we try and do challenging covers for ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and we try and keep them turning over as well. Like every week, someone will be like, "Okay, we're going to try this on Sunday," and we'll just try it regardless. You know, somebody yeah. might only half know it. Uh, but it's usually the best way to do it. That's interesting, like, because I would have thought if you're doing it for so long, you'd all kind of get to the stage where, like, ah, oh, we'll just play the same set forever and it'll be grand. No, well, we could do a lot of the same songs for over, you know, because you, you have to fill up your two hours, but we're always trying to change it up as possible. We've got a fairly large uh, set list or song list to choose from now. Um, and even, still, you know, the singer might even say okay i'm going to try this song this is the way he might just shout the chords just before we start yeah i say let's just have a go off it and uh, it's usually pretty good it's a good way that's actually a great way of of um of learning i think and uh like honing your ear as well i um when i was kind of gigging loads in my 20s um i used to sit in with a few lads um who had they used to play every tuesday in Kinsale uh, where I live in and I would just go in and sit in just for free just to get the practice mm. and it was re- really good for my ear they, like I would just sit in with them and basically play along and my ear got really good from that yeah you, know? you, were you, you weren't even really watching their hands you were just listening for the, the chord changes 
Yeah, 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 pretty much. Uh, yeah, there'll be a bit of hand watching too, but that's even that can be difficult with uh, attunings and capos and stuff. Yeah. So you can't re- you can't rely on that. No, it's yeah, and inversions. You're like playing the wrong. Yeah. Rep- did you do so? That was kind of your formal ear training. You didn't go through a phase of doing it at home, like with the pro- apps or programs, right? No, that was that was really really good for me. That actually, that um, so it was um, the guy who sings in that that band I play with every Sunday, uh, Mike O'Riordan uh, himself, and uh, Niall McCabe. I don't know if you know him, the singer. Uh, I've heard the name already. Yeah. yeah, really really good. Two really good singers, and they would play all sorts of tunes so I just sit in with them and uh, that was good for the year and it was also uh, really good for my singing I learned a lot with them you know mm. harmonies and whatever so just because they were they're both brilliant singers yeah so I'd have to fi- find my harmony around them which was really good as well very beneficial That that's kind of like a skill upon itself doing the harmony singing you know so, some yeah. people they mightn't be a, like do a lead vocal in a band ever but they're way better yeah. at doing the harmony singing than the fella doing yeah. the lead vocal yeah, uh, like I'm not the, the best in the world at it, but um, it's definitely something that's very valuable to anyone. I, I think looking to get into bands, if you can sing a bit, um, it's really, really, really good. I do quite a bit of yeah, I do quite a bit of singing uh, with Mark, especially less so with Mick because you know obviously if Susan is there, she's going to be singing harmonies and all yeah. and stuff. But yeah, it's it's um, it's important, I think. I'll come in and check out the the swinging Mikey's definitely it, seven in O'Dwyer's on a Sunday is it seven in O'Dwyer's in Washington Street yeah nice yeah, yeah. I, I know that my bar uh, one of my buddies spends his, a lot of time on Washington Street he likes the bars there so uh, what, is he in college or something no no he just likes <laughs> going out to, he just likes preachers he, it's a, it's his favorite oh spot. yeah preachers is a good spot yeah 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 Cool, sure. Well, thanks for coming on. I'll, I'll put all your links and stuff up, and um, oh, yeah. no. I'll get this out for Christmas. Definitely, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put. I'll say it now, so I have to do it. You know, make it, make it so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me.